um, to do this webinar on the concept of uh, the limits of viability. So we're going to focus on advancements and the limits of viability from fetus and neonate at, at 22 weeks uh, gestation. And what I'm showing here is a set of 22 and one seven the week twins born early from twin twin transfusion. You can see their birth weights and their uh, percentiles are both AGA. And then I'm trying to, uh, the mother keeps me up with them so that I can follow their development. So this is them at age four, and this is them at age five. Um, one of them does have um, autism, but her older term brother also has that too. Um, basically nothing uh, to disclose. So our learning objectives for this uh, webinar is when caring for infants born at 22 weeks gestation, we want to, number one, identify the importance of differences in culture and philosophy, because without the right culture, without the right philosophical beliefs, um, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you feel this baby is not viable, then the baby will be not viable. Number two, we'll examine the need for differences in management strategies. The things that work very well at 26 weeks do not work well at uh, 22 weeks. And importantly, we want to describe the short and long-term outcomes of infants born at 22 weeks gestation at a single center managed with a proactive standardized and balanced approach. And I focus on single center outcomes because outcomes are so dependent upon management that you can find wide differences in outcomes um, when you start to combine uh, centers together unless they're managing in the same way. Now, a lot of people want to know what do these 22 weekers, uh, how are they like in the future? Well, obviously none of them are that old yet, but what I'm showing here is this is a, a baby, she was born at 24 weeks gestation on first intention high frequency. This is her graduating college. And this summer at 29 years and 10 months, um, uh, she got married. When I think about the care of sort of the pre-viable population, especially at 22 weeks, I feel it's similar to the Apollo 11 mission where we went, uh, put men on the moon beginning in July 20th, 1969. And landing on the moon obviously is hard, difficult, and many people think it's impossible. And we know it's very hard and difficult because we really haven't gone back there in almost 50 years. And the key were a couple of things. One, it's really not just Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin, but the massive team, hundreds of thousands of people that participated in this mission. And the other very interesting thing, which I learned more recently, was they had to make numerous micro adjustments with feedback from mission control at earth based on radar information. So they would not miss the moon. Um, so it's, you know, they had to have this fine tune. And when I thought about doing that micro adjustments is very similar to what needs to be done during the first uh, 10 to 14 days of the uh, 22 weeks baby's life. And that's very similar to all the micro adjustments that were made um, during roughly, you know, a little bit, roughly sort of the same period of time for the Apollo uh, moon landings. Now, one of the things that is interesting is that survival in the United States is improving for premature infants born at 22 weeks gestation. And this is a, a paper from 2021. And you can see survival had stagnated at 22 weeks at five to 6%. And only about a quarter of centers offered the ability to give active therapy. In 2015, things started to change. And so the survival of all liveborns in the US Brahmanasra network tripled to about 17%, where the number of centers basically doubled offering active treatment. So it's nice that survival improved. It wasn't just more centers were trying. Now, the most recent data is for 2022, um, all VON type C centers, level three, four, survival at 22 weeks is now 27% of all liveborns. And if you look based on the number of centers are active treat treating, it's into the high 30s. Now, one of the questions is what really happened in 2015 to simulate this? And three things basically happened. In, in 2015, one of our former fellows, Matt Rasabi, had published a paper in New England Journal. And it wasn't that the survival was that high in the collection of 22 weekers in that paper. It was that these were NIH, NRN centers. And this was taken that, oh, gee, this is real. It's from a a network of 15 centers, and there were some survivors of 22 weeks. Then the New York Times picked it up and put it on the front page saying that survival of 22 weeks was possible. 
And then we also started having people come to visit Iowa or giving presentations on what was our approach as to why our survival was much higher than the, the baseline. So this is um, a, a table here um, that we would use for consults. And it looks at the survival of inborn premature infants born and I included 22, 23 and 24 weekers. And the denominator in this table I'm using is, is live born, regardless of whether resuscitation or active treatment was initiated. And so you can see at 22 weeks and it's cumulative since 2006 to 2022 in order to get large, large enough numbers. Because year to year, there can be a lot of variability. So at 22 weeks, survival being 60% out of 79 live born infants, 77% at 23 weeks out of 124 live born, and 85% survival at 24 weeks for 127 live born infants. Now, as a neonatologist, you should say, well, if I'm not offering resuscitation, obviously the baby's not going to survive. So we looked at survival for the babies that the parents wish to have uh, active therapy, and it was 64% for the NICU admissions. That's 73 admissions with 47 uh, survivors. And I like to have both these numbers because an obstetrician might say, well, you know, what if you're just cherry picking the infants you resuscitate? And a neonatologist might say, well, if, I, if we're not offering resuscitation, obviously they're not gonna survive. So it's important to have the denominator. Now, the, uh, the other thing I wanna show here, this set of twins is because a lot of people think, well, all these 22 week survivors are just poorly dated pregnancies and I was complaining in clinic um, and one of the moms said, well, Dr. Klein, you're really old because don't you remember I was IVF? And I'm like, yeah, you're right, I'm old, I forgot. She said, can you put the girls in there? I said, sure. So this is, uh, twin A was 22 and three sevenths weeks. Her sister held on for another four days and went to 23 and zero. And with, it, with those four days, she grew a lot better because she almost was LGA there and the 22 weeker was AGA. And this is them at 15 months. Now, this is clearly not unique um, to Iowa. So let's look at kind of the, uh, the worldwide uh, perspective on uh, survival. So this would be Iowa here. Now, this would be the, the Vaughn in 2021, about 24% based on all live borns. This is an interesting paper. This is data from 2022 in JAMA from the Neonatal Research Network. And this paper has been used in two different ways. If you are looking as as negative toward the approach, well, you say, well, look, survival is only 11%, and that's using a denominator of all live born, but there are centers in the network that were not offering survival or therapy or intervention at 22 weeks. So if you looked at the centers that did offer intervention, then survival is 30%. So in this case, you know, you, you have a difference between 11% and 30%, depending on your denominator. This is the Japanese research network, this is one of the Sweden, um, I'm sorry, this is Cologne, Germany. This is Japanese Research Network, and this is Sweden. And now and the other important thing, you can see the significant increase in survival of all the centers once you get to 23 weeks. So obviously no one wants to be having a baby at 22 weeks, um, but the survival isn't nothing, it's not zero. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about Cologne, Germany because this is where the cherry picking concept has come from. And so in 2016, this paper here, they, they published, well, their survival was 60%. But the interesting thing, and that was the babies that were, all, that were given active therapy, but out of all live born, it was only 38%. So you can see when there's a huge difference between um, survival of all live born and, and the numbers of babies that were truly admitted to the NICU, is this being kind of self-selecting cherry picking concept. And this is something that they do do. They're a little bit more paternalistic and they won't offer resuscitation at 22 weeks unless there's a full course of steroids and the baby's vigorous. Now, if you look at small numbers, you can see some you know, in very high survivals. This is a Japanese paper published in 2022, survival 81%, small numbers 13 out of 16. They published one recently in 2023, last month. Survival again around 80, 81, 82%. Again, small numbers. And we can show the same thing if I self select a different years. So at Iowa, if I showed you um, survival here, it was 
in 2016 was 77%, 10 out of 13. And in 2021, survival was 78%, seven out of nine. So again, with small numbers, you can you can look, you can say, well, survival is incredibly high. Now, I think it's wrong to use small numbers. I think you want to use the largest numbers that you can generate. So we will still counsel at 60% survival. And I'd be upset if people were saying, well, I was there in 2021. So I want to tell people 78%. I think that's um, inappropriate and misleading. So what we want to do is practice what, what I would call a proactive approach. And the question is, what is a proactive approach? So it's a philosophical expectation that infants born at 22 weeks gestation will survive and thrive. Um, if that's not the expectation of everyone that works in the unit, everything will go poorly and the babies will not survive. Oh, excuse me. It's to understand that successfully caring for an infant born at 22 weeks is a constantly changing technological and medical challenge rather than a fixed immutable law of nature. Now, it was a fixed immutable law of nature in 1990. And we knew these babies were at the biological threshold um, because we could ventilate them, but not oxygenate them because CO2 diffuses 20 times more efficiently through tissue than oxygen. Things have changed since um, 1990. And the things that have changed is we use antenatal steroids, we use first intention high frequency, we have the ability to use inhaled NO, and we have um, surfactants and actually very efficacious surfactants. So th things have changed. It's not really a biological threshold anymore, which it was in the past. It's the realization that a large part of successfully caring for infants born to 22 weeks is having a standardized multidisciplinary culture that supports a team approach to care of these infants both medically and emotionally. And you can't have variability depending which attendings on service, which fellow is on that night, which nurse practitioner has the baby and which nurse is working that shift because um, it will fail. And so there has to be a standardized approach. You can't have people setting up four different ventilators depending which attendings on. You should have one type of ventilator and everyone understands that. And it needs to be both medically and emotionally because even if you have 60% plus survival, if you happen to get three babies in a row, which not unrealistic, that all pass away in a period of a week or two, then suddenly no one wants to do this anymore. So you have to kind of focus on the survivors and not on the patients that pass away. Just like oncologists func function on the survivors, not, not functioning purely on the babies, or children that pass away or adults. Um, number four, you wanna always respect and support the parent's preference, either initiate active treatment or choose comfort care. So we're not uh, paternalistic. You know, we let the parents decide, even though we know that the baby probably would pass away. So certainly we have babies that mom is febrile, 101, she's been ruptured, for a long time. She has severe chorioamnionitis. We counsel that the chance of the baby surviving in that case is very, very low, less than 1%. And they say, well, can you just try anyway? And so we do. And so that's why you can see we only really had six patients that we did not, at 22 weeks, that we did not initiate active treatment, in which case the parents choose comfort care. At the same time, we've also had one that chose comfort care that certainly I was slightly queasy about because it was twins and the one that was being delivered was a female, which had better survival chances, but the parents were like, well, we're just nervous. We don't, you know, we feel uncomfortable doing this. The baby lived a few hours and passed away. And then a few days later, her brother was born and he's 14 years old now. Mutually supportive interdisciplinary teamwork with the obstetricians to begin treatment before birth with the use of antenatal steroids, even possibly before 22 weeks. Antenatal steroids are very critical for survival and good outcomes. And we do our antenatal steroids at 21 and 5, 7 weeks, and we'll talk more about that. Um, it's to realize that infants born at 22 weeks are not just smaller versions of infants born at 26 weeks. It should be treating accordingly. 
so that you know what you can do at 26 weeks gee this baby looks good we probably can exit that baby, that baby if, if the lungs are doing well at a couple of days of life and nothing bad's going to happen you do that to a 22 weeker and you've just increased their chance of death four to five uh, fold obviously they are smaller and so um, you want access to two oet tubes Number seven, to recognize that the greatest error of not to have tried and failed, but in the trying, we did not give it our best effort. Um, it's very easy to kind of do this, but you just go, oh, it's just too hard to get all these labs and make all these fluid adjustments, make all these vent adjustments and keep paying attention to things. And you can't, you have, you have to overcome that thought that if we're going to do this, it's going to take a huge amount of effort, especially in the transition period of a 22 weeker which is, you know, can be 10 to 14 days long compared to transition in a term newborn, which usually four hours. And number eight, to understand that three sorts of ethical concerns are generally raised about treatment of babies born so prematurely. One is that too many survivals have severe neurocognitive impairment. Another is that parents do not want such treatment. A third is that it costs too much. Evidence, evidence suggests that none of these concerns is valid. And that's from John Lantos. He published a paper on this in 2021. And that will be um, my major ethical discussion at this point. So philosophically, we expect these infants to survive and thrive. We know it's very hard. We know it's very difficult, but we know it's not impossible. Um, the, the, this one is a 22 and one seventh weaker, 49th percentile AGA. Um, this is her at age five. This is, she was on the cover of the New York Times back in, in 2015. Um, she came from another hospital where they said, well, 22 weekers can't survive. So we're not going to do anything. Mom called to our OBs and our OB said, oh, just come on down. And she got her steroids and, and flu. This is another female here, 22 and two seven weeks, SG8, 379 grams, third percentile. <clears throat> she also flew through. Um, she's there because a lot of people say, well, all Iowa babies are hardy uh, Scandinavian farm stock. Therefore, they're born in the cornfields and they just uh, lasso a piglet and ride their way out. Um, now, here is a baby that is a farmer. He's 22 and 600 weeks, male, um, 11th percentile, 465 grams. He had severe pulmonary hypoplasia, prolonged code in the, the DR. The parents said to keep trying. He did have medical NEC. He did have grade three IVH without um, beating a shunt. Um, he is feeding his calf there. He did develop a chronic seizure disorder um, in middle school. So overall, you can kind of see two out of three babies sail through with really no neurocognitive challenges at all. Um, other philosophical differences are, is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? Are we rising, are we falling? Well, if you look at centers from the 2015 article by Rasavi, they found that rates of active treatment account for 78% of variation at 22 or 23 weeks. So you have to decide to treat, but the rates of active treatment did not account for any of the variation outcomes among those born at 25 or 26 weeks. So differences in hospital rates of active treatment did not account for all variation outcomes. For example, among hospitals that treat 100% of infants at 24 weeks, rates of risk adjusted survival varied from 42 to 70%. So factors other than just the decision to resuscitate contribute heavily to the variation in outcomes, which is why management is so critical. So just deciding to offer resuscitation at 22 to 23 weeks, especially at 22 weeks without adjusting management strategies is not the best approach for the care of these extremely delicate and premature patients. And this is why many centers, if you don't prepare to have a team, a team approach, a multidisciplinary approach, a standardized approach with therapies and just start saying, okay, we'll just start resuscitating, you're gonna have probably, or will have poor outcomes. So one of the most important things is to have a small baby system. It doesn't have to be a small baby unit, but it can be a tiny baby team. But what a small baby system is, is a dedicated, integrated structure and culture for extremely premature infants. The key is the system is the star. And building a system can take, um, you know, two years. Um, we have a separate dedicated unit of 14 beds. So it could be our small baby unit. But we also put our most critically ill patients there, too. 
and we call that Bay 1 neonatal critical care unit. We admit all babies under 29 weeks are admitted here, as well as the most critically ill term infants. Now, a 28 and 5 seventh weeker might be there four hours. The 22 weeker might be there uh, eight weeks. We have a separate nursing staff so they can become experienced in handling both really critically ill term and preterm babies, as well as in the delicate skin care of these babies. We have a separate location, which is basically right next to our labor and delivery. So we get these babies on high frequency of ventilation before 10 minutes of life. We have a separate critical care lab just for the whole NICU, which to me is very important because getting these lab values, especially CO2 and glucose, help you to be neuroprotective. And we have a separate medical team for just these 12 to 13, occasionally 14 patients. This is very important because the separate attending service, sort of neonatal intensivists, with a fellow always there, NMP, uh, residents, dietitians, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, you can dedicate a lot of time. It might take three or four hours to round on 12 to 14 patients, but allows you to fine tune everything that needs to be done. Other teams we have in sort of a level three area, you might have 24 to 26 patients and the step down unit, you might be rounding on 38 patients, but it takes roughly the same amount of time. So this is sort of a view of our structure. You can, you can see that the bay one area is right next to labor and delivery. So luckily we don't have to move patients on elevators through tunnels over sky bridges and so forth. And like I said, we can get them on their high frequency ventilator before 10 minutes of life. Um, there's another uh, two second percentile, 395 gram uh, twin infant, uh, 22 weeker there. So you must begin at the beginning. You have to have steroids; They're critical. Um, you have to have interdisciplinary team work maternal fetal medicine, which is the huge key. It's very difficult to do this without successfully without steroids. So if we look at the evidence, um, steroids at 22 to 25 weeks gestation <clears throat> reduces severe morbidities, including IVH, and importantly, the incidence of neurodevelopment impairment in 18, 22 months, and significantly increases survival. So in a paper from 2018, it showed survival doubled from 18 to 39%. And in a paper from 2022, they did not separate the 22 and 23 weekers, but increased survival by 50% from 36% to 54%. And there are numerous other papers showing that antenatal steroids improve lung maturity, reduces RDS, next, severe IVH and mortality, proven at greater or equal to 24 weeks. So if we look at our use of antenatal steroids, one of the keys at Iowa you could see here is that for all our VLBWs um, from 22 to 33 weeks, we're hovering around 95% ster antenatal steroid exposure. And if you look at the VON, um, the VON used to hover around 80 and now it's sort of hovering a little bit, you know, a little bit below 90. And that took them about 18 years sort of to catch up, but they still haven't caught up. I mean, there's no reason the bond shouldn't be where we are at, at 95 percentile. Now, the other thing in the um, babies that I'm gonna talk about their, their two-year outcome for the Iowa inborn cohort at 22 to 23 weeks, steroid use was 91%. And again, that's an important point as to why our nerve development outcomes are good. Now, one of the things that happened in September of 2021 that helped a lot is that the ACOG changed their guidelines. So now it used to say here, not recommended at 22 and zero to 22 and six, seven weeks, any of steroids, and they put consider. And consider basically means, hey, if the parents want to initiate resuscitation, you should be giving any of steroids. And if the parents don't want resuscitation, then why should you be giving it? Now, Obviously, we give it a 21 and 5 sevenths. That's based on the pharmacokinetics of antenatal beta methasone taking 48 hours for maximum impact. Not recommended doesn't mean harmful. Not recommended is just there's just not enough evidence. And the only time they say recommended is when there's large RC randomized controlled trials and they put recommended. Um, so looking at Iowa's inborn cohort, um, it's not all Scandinavian farmers. It's 78% um, white at 22 and 67% at 23. Um, you can see here is black and Hispanic. Now, one of the interesting things is uh, looking at the 22 weekers survival, it's 62% for black, 59% for white, no significant differences there. More interestingly, and this is well known, is that the female superiority 
not just in fetal lung development, but in obviously all aspects of life. So the male survival is 56%, again, inborn, and female is 65%. The next interesting thing is to look at C-sections. Now, <clears throat> we don't do any elective fetal monitoring until 23 weeks. So we basically don't section at 22 weeks. However, recently, starting in 2016, we did six C-sections. This is for maternal indications only. These were pregnancies that had to be um, ended and the mothers did not want to induce the baby. They wanted the uh, sections so that the baby would survive. Um, you can see once we start fetal monitoring at 23 weeks, the C-section rate goes way up because of you now you're finding fetal distress. The other interesting thing is why do you have a baby at 22 weeks? And multiples are very common, both twins and triplets. And so that you can see here, 39% of all our of all of our 22 weekers in that cohort were multiples, and it drops off to 24% at 23, and then 13% at 24. Chorioaminitis is also another major issue at 22 and 23 weeks. So basically, you have to consider most of these babies as being infected, you can't depend upon a positive bulk culture for your length of antibiotics because they're all on latency antibiotics. Now, the C-section question is obviously controversial. Sweden does not do any C-sections at 22 weeks, but it's interesting in the paper from 2018, looking at in the U.S. Vaughn units, uh, there are centers that feel like if you give any of steroids, you must monitor, you must do a C-section. We don't feel that that is a true statement for Iowa. We feel that you want to give any of steroids, and then we start monitoring at 23. It's not clear yet um, how strong the evidence is of the of weighing the risk to the mom um, and the benefit of the baby. Okay, so baby's born. What do we do differently in the delivery room? <clears throat> well, one of the things is you can't start with 30% oxygen. You need to start with higher oxygen because there's a huge diffusion gradient when you're dealing with canalicular lungs. So you initiate resuscitation with 50% oxygen and you titrate per goals to minimize hypoxia and hyperoxia. Now looking at some data that exists in an RCT um, back from 2017, and obviously no 22 weekers were included in this, but if you look at babies under 28 weeks, when resuscitated with room air, mortality was 22% and it dropped threefold to 6% with 100% oxygen. There's a current RCT going on that will determine should we start with 100% oxygen or not. But I can say our practice for many, many years has been start with 50% uh, to get over that diffusion gradient. Most of the babies respond quite nicely. And then the team is rapidly weaning their oxygen following the NRP standards. We know it's really important because at five minutes of life in another study, if you don't read more, if you don't reach greater than equal to 80% by five minutes, you have a greater risk of death or neurodevelopment disability. So our teams are very good at most of the time, they're already weaning the oxygen at five minutes. Now, we also electively intubate with two O tubes, similar to Sweden and Japan at 22 weeks. And then the team will decide for 23 weeks if they're big enough to have two five. We just don't want anyone struggling with the tube. The next thing that's quite different than a 26 weeker <clears throat> is at birth, um, you want to intubate. So invasive compared to non-invasive respiratory support in the delivery room reduced the severe IVH and death at 22 to 23 weeks by twofold. And this was a publication recently in 2022 at the University of Alabama. So sure, if you have a vigorous 24, 25, 26 weeker, let's see if we can avoid the need for intubation, but trying to avoid the need for intubation at 22 and 23 weeks is going to worsen mortality and worsen severe IVH. Um, and then the other thing is you can't use the old rule weight in kilos plus six centimeters because you'll be right main stemmed as you can see here. So you have to think, you know, okay, this is a tiny baby. We're going to have to be closer to six or maybe a little bit less of the lip. Now, the next thing is we transfer the NICU, we use gentle bagging, it's focused on the heart rate and saturations, um, and we use a PEEP of five. And you have to look at what's the data, there was some data saying, well, we should really use really high PEEPs. Well, what's nice is a randomized control trial was done um, in 2019, and called the SAIL trial, and they use very high PEEP, very sustained inflations with the idea of trying to aggressively recruit. And instead, it aggressively uh, increased mortality. So there was a significant increase in early death trying to do these massive peeps. And it went up fivefold mortality, 7.5% versus 1.4% in the controls. 
And most of the sale deaths occurred in the 23 to 24 week um, uh, slice. The next step is we start with the 10 minutes of life on first intention high frequency, and we don't give the surfactant until we have a chest radiograph obviously done as soon as possible. Because if you give the surfactant too soon, only to one lung, you have a very difficult challenge ahead of you. You want standardization of care. It doesn't really matter so much the order that's done on here, but the goal should be the same. The baby shouldn't be hypothermic. <clears throat> they should get surfactant. Um, Dextro should be going and someone should be talking to the mom. All this should occur within the, the first hour. Um, now, the other thing, I'm sorry, in the delivery room that I didn't also state is that it's important to avoid hypothermia. And these babies obviously have the polyethylene blankets and hats. The delivery room's at 25 Celsius and they need a transwarmer mattress. Um, also in the NICU, we try to standardize everything as much as possible. So we have computerized physician order entry. So we have the, uh, you know, admission is part of this. But even if you have standardized protocols, people should still double check them because it's very easy to sometimes choose the wrong protocol and start on the wrong, uh, the wrong stuff. Things that we've agreed that are well proven, that are automatically in the order set, all these babies will be on caffeine. Barbara Schmidt's work clearly showed the benefit of that. The vitamin A is a little bit more controversial whether you can get it or not, but we think it, it helps with um, long-term survival and, and more severe BBD. But importantly, in the, this older study, it did show it reduced um, the incidence of BPD in, in the 1999 study there. <clears throat> we also have paper guidelines. We have a neonatal reference card or fellows card, and this allows us the standardization of fluids, transfusion guidelines, phototherapy guidelines, <clears throat> ventilation goals, initial respiratory settings, outcome data for counseling, feeding guidelines, and so on and so on. This is what it looks like. This is not the, meant to be read. Um, I'm glad to share a version of this. Um, again, it relates to our approach, but the main thing is we don't suddenly having people doing phototherapy different and transfusions different. Everyone ideally should be following this. So one of the questions, if you're born before 24 weeks, how do you survive without a VLI at this canalicular stage? Well, we know that you have terminal bronchioles branched to respiratory bronchioles, which branch to alveolar ducts, which terminate the tip into the alveolar sac, thin wall and vascularized. And this is felt to begin at 24 to 27 weeks. But you know, nothing is drawn in a straight line in humans. Everything's on a bell-shaped curve. So obviously it can begin before this. And importantly, the cranial segments mature faster than the caudal segments. So you can have areas of the lung that are mature enough to survive even at 22 weeks if you minimize damage to the lung. And that's one of the keys there. So we want antenatal steroids to accelerate lung maturation, differentiation of velar type one cell that's for gas exchange of type two cells for surfactant, thin the mesenchyme for gas exchange and increase invasion of capillaries and airspace for oxygen transfer. And we want a lung protective strategy to minimize volume trauma. So we're talking about patients right here at 22 to 24 weeks. And we know there's some overlap of that secular stage with the canalicular stage. So at the canalicular stage of lung development, it's critically important to avoid shear force injury, volume trauma leading to PIE, which is a primary problem that people have with these babies. In pneumothorax, we're a first intention high frequency center. We use the JET for all infants um, at 22 to 26 weeks who require mechanical ventilation. The 26 weeker is vigorous, they can go on non invasive ventilation. Um, PIE is the major problem in the 22, 23 weekers. And it's a collection of gases outside the conducting gas exchange and airways, which obstructs pulmonary blood flow and ventilation, develops within 48 hours of life, high mortality, morbidity. It's worse the younger you are, the lower the birth rate, the lower gestational age. Prior to surfactant, the mortality for VLBW infants was greater than 60%. If conventional PIP reached greater than 25 at any time in the first two weeks of life, well, some people on conventional ventilators that are volume guarantee, they often will, will have a pressure limit as high as 25, not higher. Um, this is what's called four quadrant PIE that led to this uh, baby passing away at it. Well, it was a 24 weeker, the triplets, the other two passed away in outside institution. This baby, we were able to reverse the PIE. 
Unfortunately, the baby had spent so many days with no cardiac output, as you can see from the compressed heart, that it had severe cystic PVL and we withdrew support. Um, so looking at centers that have high survival at 22 weeks and proactive centers in Sweden, Japan, and in the US, there are things that are in common. And that's what this paper was looking at, things that are in common and things that are subtly different. Um, we all have antenatal steroids. We all intubate in the DR with 2O tubes. We don't do the exact same ventilator management, but as soon as, um, if you're on conventional, you have very low threshold for converting to high frequency. And we have kind of the same uh, uh, goals where the goal is to have a neuroprotective CO2 versus a lung protective CO2. So looking at this, um, we all follow CO2 levels closely with rigid adherence to avoid fluctuations in cerebral blood flow, neuroprotective focus. We want to use proactive use of first intention, low tidal volume strategies, lung protective focus, but you start with a jet or an oscillator or a conventional device. But if you're starting with a conventional device, you have to be very cognizant. If you start to have any issue with PIE, you have to have early rescue with high frequency being available. Um, all use the 202 electively at 22 weeks, all avoid over distension. It's neuroprotective focus. Um, again, focus on prevention of PIE. You don't push them off the ventilator, extubate when ready for success. Importantly, you have to have consistent ventilator and respiratory strategy for all 22 week infants. There should not be random variation in management styles depending on the women of the neonatologist. So we can't do oscillator one day, jet the next day, SMV, PC, PS the next day, or volume guarantee conventional the next day. It's going to be a problem. And the oxygen saturation targets on all these centers are based more on post menstrual age, and the alarms are used for emergency, not to titrate the SATs. Um, Anti-value trauma approach with the JET, um, the literature back in the 80s and 90s showed it increases healing of PIE, reduces incidence of air leaks, improves survival in neonates and pneumothorax or PIE, and in the 90s showed that it did reduce the incidence of BBD in half with, with infants with RDS treated with surfactants, so it seems like a good strategy. Um, unfortunately, it remains controversial, and this is from Reese Clark, who say, just remember it's the carpenter, not the hammer. Although the tools we use to support gas exchange are important, so the expertise and training of the carpenters that use them. Without physiologic targeted strategies, our tools for supporting gas exchange can, can promote injury instead of improving the quality of lives we save. And we see that many times, just throwing someone on a high-frequency ventilator without the right strategy will make things quite worse. So just briefly, these are sort of the jet settings that we would use at Iowa for sub-24 week babies. You start at a rate of 300, which is an IE ratio one to nine. You went all that time in exhalation with the fixed eye time because you need to decrease air trapping from passive elastic recoil. And since you have a 202, which has high resistance radius to the fourth power, you have to have adequate time to avoid that air trapping. And you can see air trapping in that X-ray. And over time, the rate can be increased as needed as the lung developments and the increased rate will improve oxidation and ventilation. Fixed eye time of 20 milliseconds to reduce volume trauma. Major goals, avoid PIE, hyperinflation, over distension, and avoid hypocarbia. The initial PIP um, usually is in the low 20s if it's a 252, but most of the time for a 22 week or with a 202, probably is gonna be in the mid 20s. And the key is to start at five centimeters of water so you don't get hyperinflated. The old studies show, had people starting at seven, but that was prior to good use of antenatal steroids and prior to our better surfactants. It's important to avoid this hyperinflation because that mechanical injury to the extremely maternal from, from hyperinflation is bad because you get rapid PIE. But even more importantly, you will impede venous return. As you can see in that x-ray, there's no blood in that right atrium. And having falling up the starling curve and impeding venous return and you have no preload, you have no cerebral blood flow. So you can already lose your patient's neurologic outcome by spending the first you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes of your life hyperinflated and not having adequate blood flow to the brain. So you wanna be neuroprotective. So we're much happier being seven to eight ribs, maybe on a, even 100% oxygen as we got the surfactant in to be nine, 10 on 21% and having no blood flow or inadequate blood flow to the brain. So neuroprotection always has to come before lung protection. Um, the balanced ventilator goals, again, neuroprotection outweighs lung protection. So you have to follow CO2 levels, CO2 levels closely with rigid adherence to goals to avoid hypocarbia as high, and hypercarbia, both can impact cerebral blood flow dramatically. 
So we kind of target 45 to 55, maybe low 40s, high 50s the first three days. Um, auto regulation starts to get better and we'll still target pretty tight 45 to 60 the next four days. You know, if we're talking about the baby's 10 days old and we're worried more about PIE, okay, maybe we'll talk about more like 50 to 65 or 55 to 70, but not in the first week. The gases may need to be followed as frequently as every three hours. If we have a line, if we don't have a good line, we'll cap stick them, hill stick them every six hours. Again, this is very neuroprotective because um, there's lots of data associating with the lower the CO2 or the higher the CO2, greater risk of PVL and IPH. Um, if the CO2 is way off, we'll repeat it in 20 minutes. It's fine tuning, you can wait till the next gas. The saturations, we'll base it on post-menstrual age with the goal to have a low incidence of ROP. So once your SAT is 94 to 95, you don't know what your PO2 is. So we keep, as you can see in these tiny babies, the SAT's low, the lower side, 80 to 93 um, until they're past 27, 26 weeks post-menstrual age. Um, well, think about repeat surfactant for post-surfactant slump. 20% of babies under 1,000 grams do develop at this. Post-surfactant slump means you're, you're not making endogenous surfactant yet. Um, 63 to 70% of infants with post surfactant slump have an improvement in the severity of their respiratory disease with the treatment. Two or more doses predict it. Any needle steroids reduce it. Either calfactant or poractant treats it. Um, but if the problem is you have, if you have a hemodynamic syndrome PDA, well, then you need to also address that. So you could you know, temporarily make things worse if you have a large PDA. Um, but once you start to address that large PDA, if that's not making a difference, then you still can give surfactant. So there are times, at least 8% of the time, um, that they'll get better. Sometimes it's even more than that. Now, other things that cause surfactant dysfunction are sepsis, pneumonia, and atelectotrauma. And you can see here that most of the time the post-surfactant slump begins between day seven and day, day 10. Um, extubation is, is a major touchstone, a major critical step um, to have a good outcome. And the danger is if you fail extubation, and this is not at 22 and 23, but the, if you fail extubation for 24 to 26 weeks, it's associated with poor outcomes. So failure in the first two weeks of life, um, again, for babies basically less than 26 weeks, is associated with increased death before discharge, 28% versus 6%. That's almost fivefold. So we control an elective extubation 100%. Um, so this population, you definitely don't want to be pushing 22 and 23 weekers uh, off in the first two weeks. And when you fail, you have an increased incidence of BPD, late onset sepsis, and severe IVH, even after adjusting for gestational age and uh, illness. Another paper showed if you failed in the first 12 days of life, even three days later, you're still in much higher event settings. And then a recent paper from the APEX cohort showed that early failure before eight days of life, you again have a greater risk of death. And again, it's babies less than 26 weeks. In that paper, they had no 22 weekers and, and there was 100% failure rate at 23 weeks. And the early deaths you know, are often due to pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hemorrhage, IVH, uh, and even neck from the severe ischemia that occurs when you fail. So we don't push them off. Uh, when you do extubate them, it's best to use non-invasive ventilation because that will decrease rates of extubation failure and BPD. And we use NAVA. So most of our 22 weekers, we like the birth rate to be doubled. And once they're over this 850 to 900 gram and they're doing well, they'll get extubated. Um, what about the pulmonary outcomes for babies born at the cannulicular stage? Well, old BPD, as you can see here, is is caused by oxidative mechanical injury resulting in large lung cysts with progressive interstitial novella or septal fibrosis areas of atelectasis alternating with hyperinflation. This is sort of what occurred in the 28 week babies. This began in the 60s and oxygen at 36 weeks makes sense for that population. But for 22 weekers, 23 weekers, you have to think about new BPD, which is seen over here, which is disruption of lung development with a re rest of the velar septation and vascular development leading to velar simplification. So for infants born at the canalicular stage of lung development, 22 weekers, 23 weekers, you really want to focus on the 21st century definition, which is from Eric Jensen at CHOP, brilliant paper, invasive mechanical ventilation in 36 weeks, instead of the 20th century definition, which is need for supplement oxygen in 36 weeks. 
So the pulmonary goals for these babies, number one, you want to avoid lethal BPD. And one tracks this, this is grade 3A. This is you die from respiratory failure before you even get to 36 weeks. This is what I call hidden mortality from lung disease. And we'll talk about how often that actually occurs um, if you don't use first intention approach with high frequency. And number two is a reduced grade three BPD, invasive respiratory support at 36 weeks. And grade three BPD is the problem. This is when, this is the type of disease that's associated with the twofold higher rate of late death, serious respiratory morbidity, tracheostomy, for example, um, supplemental oxygen for greater than two years and moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. And so here is Eric Jensen's work showing grade one, grade two, and grade three. Now, obviously we want to have, we want to have, you know, have all these shift, um, but the main thing is we want to be alive and be off the ventilator. And again, we're talking 22 and 23 weeks. So looking at our respiratory outcomes at 22 and 23 weeks with first intention high frequency, um, in this uh, paper, small numbers, so that's why the 22-week survival there is 70%, 23 is 82%, all with first intention high frequency. Now you can say, oh, the median duration on the vent 63 days, that seems long, but the median postmenstrual time at extubation was 31 weeks postmenstrual age. So uh, half the babies are off the vent before 31 weeks, 75% off the vent by 33, a quarter off the vent by 29 weeks. And we're talking 22 and 23 weekers. So how many had grade three BPD? Well, 6% from in that paper from 06 to 2015. And more recently, since we've gotten more babies transferred antenatally with prolonged rupture of membranes, including hypoplasia, 9%. But importantly, tracheostomy, out of, of our 22 and 23 weekers since 2006 through 2022, 1.5%. So only three out of 195, 22 and 23 weekers require tracheostomy with a first intention approach. And the 31 weeks postmenstrual age is not very different from the APEX trial. This is uh, from uh, the 20 paper from 2022. <clears throat> and if you looked at the babies there, 31 weeks, 31.3 weeks, was the median, here's their interquartile range. And these are babies getting extubated at greater than 35 week, days of life. And in that paper, they excluded 22 weekers. <clears throat> okay. Next major challenge is, is, is TPN. So we want to you know, minimize the incidence and in getting the feeds going of spontaneous or focal intestinal perforation and necrotizing or colitis. So prophylactic endomethacin should not be used. There's no benefit shown in any of the papers done in the recent era for this population. Um, and especially you want to avoid the combination of endomethacin and steroids. When you had hydrocortisone with endomethacin, the risk goes up ninefold. And the same thing if you had dexamethacin with endomethacin, the, the incident went up fourfold. Now, since you don't do prophylactic endomethacin, what's the PDA approach? Well, we use a targeted neonatal echocardiographic hemodynamics approach. And we have a screening protocol done in the first day of first 18, 24 hours of life, and then adjust. And the main thing that we found using that approach, the thing that impacted more than anything was NEC. And you can see since starting that approach and not tolerating a large shunt for uh, three or four weeks in these babies, are, the neck rates were incredibly low, you know, mainly often only just 1%. So, Early trophic feeds, another thing that we do within 24 to 36 hours, we always want breast milk or donor breast milk. We go very slowly. We give our bolus feeds by pump. We used to use probiotics. Uh, it's no longer supported by the FDA. That's neither here nor there. The main issue is a lot of these babies have anthocytic meconium. So you have to early detect meconium obstruction of prematurity to avoid or minimize meconium-related ileus or intestinal injury, kind of the focal intestinal perforation issue. The next is it has to be a priority to minimize hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, and allowing these babies to get dehydrated, so acute kidney injury. So we follow everything very closely, frequent labs. We target glucose as 50 to 150. There's no benefit of having glucose as over 150 other than increases problems with ROP, um, IVH, sepsis, and so forth. And follow sodium to avoid getting dehydrated or fluid overloaded. So 135 to 150. This requires frequent labs. We don't use humidity in order to accelerate keratinization of the skin. And also, we don't have to limit, limit our fluids. So our total fluids may start at 150 per kilo per day. 
uh, they may go as high as 250 to 350 for 12 hours. Um, and then as the baby keratinized, we, we go down. None of these babies are fluid overloaded. They're all losing weight appropriately. We always use three fluids, UAC fluid without dextrose, but with acetate, uh, TPN at 60 to 100 per kilo. So all these babies get optimal protein, calcium, phosphorus. And then there's a third fluid widened, D2 and F carrier fluid to help maintain the dextrose. Um, we use ambient or minimal humidification to accelerate keratinization. We follow fluids tightly. The key thing is don't let them get hyperglycemic. So your initial GIR is often less than four per kilo per minute. We use a lot of sodium acetate and then potassium acetate to compensate for renal losses to avoid the need for aggressive ventilation to keep pH above 725. We start interlipids slowly, not before 12 hours life. Randomized controlled trial showed if you did start it before 12, uh, 12 hours of life, you doubled mortality, went 48% versus 24%. And that was due to pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, we never exceed two grams per kilo. This is a liver protective strategy. The goal protein is three and a half to four grams per kilo per day. We start NVN at birth. We try to get them, if the glucose tolerates our starter NVN, we try to get up to one and a half grams per kilo. We photoprotect our NVN from creation to delivery, shielding this from light improved survival rate in premature infants. That's from a, pa uh, a paper out of uh, Montreal. We know premature infants have minimal antioxidant defenses. NVM when light explodes generates hydrogen peroxide and leads to free radical cellular damage associated with increased mortality. Um, this is just, um, We've had two 21 weekers uh, that are home now and two others, hopefully we'll make it home. And this is the 21 weeker mainly showing it because you can see the skin care is pretty critical. Um, our fellows follow up the patient. So this fellow here is the same fellow here. And you can see first intention jet, there's the high pressure tubing. And then you can see the polyethylene wrap there. The main thing is we use a silicon polymer which prevents the skin from cracking. And we do not use chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine causes severe skin injury, chemical burns, blisters, and uh, neurotoxicity. Blood pressure, just to make it short, rather than spending um, a three-day workshop on it. You know, if you keep your mean, it's old rule, or you can say, okay, let's look at systolic 10 to 12 above the mean within a few hours of birth. Um, treated infants have higher survival rate without major morbidity. So this is a paper out of 2017 from the EpiPage 2 cohort study looking at should you intervene or not for isolated hypotension. So keeping the systolics in these cases in the 30s um, to, to higher, slightly higher, will maintain, have better outcomes. So treated infants have significant higher survival rate with major morbidity. We'll use stress dose hydrocortisone as our initial vasopressor. If you give a fluid bolus, we give it very slowly. Um, part of that is, you know, is that it's helping to make sure that we at least have adequate intravascular volume and it gives time for the hydrocortisone to kick in, which takes two hours and 45 minutes. Um, now, if you have poor ventricular activity because of poor urine output or rising lactate or because your echo shows it, dobutamine is a good approach. Now, dobutamine doesn't normally raise blood pressure, but if it's improving pH with better cardiac output, it often will. This is sort of the Japanese approach. True, but if you have septic shock, we talked 30% of these babies can be have chorioimmunitis. You'll need additional vasopressors. Um, dopamine is, is tend to fall a little bit out of favor because of the impact on the pulmonary vascular bed. So if we're concerned about that, norepinephrine was another place. So there's another gelatinous baby there. Um, other quick things, everyone's on prophylactic nystatin to help minimize fungal sepsis. And they're also on prophylactic fluconazole. We know from Danny Benjamin, a six week course will reduce invasive candidiasis, but we don't wanna leave a pick line in for six weeks. So we'll give it for a minimum of two weeks. And we wanna make sure this skin is completely keratinized. We've also started this IAGG screening. Um, there was a randomized control trial published in 92 that showed prophylactic IVIG reduced infections in the 500 to 750 gram group. We don't give it every day for six weeks, but we screen. In that paper, the babies that got sick always had um, IgG levels less than 200. So we'll screen once a week. And when it drops below 200, they'll get a dose. And that's usually more than enough to get them through it. And then um, for removing a central line, we always give a dose of antibiotics for the pick lines uh, to reduce post catheter removal sepsis when you strip off that vegetation. Other controversial differences 
we always screen thyroid again at one month of life. We've published on that to show about 10 to 15% of these babies will need thyroid replacement for up to three years. Um, we do use uh, stress dose and physiologic hydrocortisone replacement. Our normal stress dose course is four days, but if they deteriorate after that, they'll get on physiologic replacement and ideally I'll grow it before they go home. Um, inhaled NO, we will give for cardiopulmonary failure. These babies often have pulmonary hypertension. They usually have preterm rupture of membranes or pulmonary hyperplasia or acute or chronic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, at 22 weeks, in the, since 2018, 55% of these babies needed inhaled NO at 22 weeks, 46% 23, 37 to 24. Published on this recently, a positive response, 63% of infants have a positive response at 22 to 26 weeks, but it's even higher at 22 to 23. It's 78% of a positive response. So there's a lot of uh, the pulmonary vasculature is quite aggressively present in a 22 weeker, very similar to a 42 weeker, because um, they're they really don't want any blood flow to their lungs at 22 weeks. Management changes probiotics, which went can hold from the FDA on September 29th. Uh, delayed cord clamping, 48% of the babies have had delayed cord clamping at 22 to 23 weeks. We use aggressive phototherapy. This is a heavily neuroprotective strategy. This is a big randomized controlled trial from 08. It's significantly reduced overall NDI as well as profound impairment. And this is, we've got this all stabilized out. We have a targeted echo service since 2018. We use it to detect significant shunts or pulmonary hypertension or poor ventricular function. If there's a significant shunt in the first week of life, we use acetaminophen for seven days to reduce the shunt. Works about 50% of the time. If the shunt's still a problem, the second week of life, we'll get into methicin, um, two courses, and if needed as the weeks go by, then if they're big enough a mechanical closure, um, piccolo, or if, they, if it's really bad shunt, they could have surgery. We do about one surgery a year and probably about 15 to 20 piccolos. Now, one of the, um, one of the things is to think about what do 22 weekers die from? So let's look at the proportional cause of death for inborn 22 weekers at Iowa. And you can't just say, oh, they died because they're extremely premature, which is what the AAP does. If you look at mortality, oh, it's extreme prematurity. Well, that's useless as a neonatologist. So what we want to do is look at what they die from of the 40% that die and figure out how to fix those things. So infection is the leading cause at Iowa. Um, it would be because many of these babies are born because of early onset sepsis and actually feeding is such a difficult thing. You have risk of neck and SIP and FIP. Um, obviously we will redirect care. Can't always guarantee hundred percent any no steroid use. Um, can't always guarantee the baby's gonna do perfect. So we will reject care. Birth trauma, pregnancy asphyxia, 15%. We can't do much about that. We can't figure that out even for term babies. The important thing is respiratory failure for Iowa is only responsible for 8% of the deaths of infants born to 22 weeks. So only 8% of these babies die of respiratory failure. Well, why is that so impressive? Well, why don't we look at the um, rest of the country? So here in the peanut trial, where they had 941 uh, babies, 19 sites, and 60% of all the deaths at 24 weeks were respiratory failure versus 8% for us at 22. So let's look at that a little bit more, I'm sorry, a little bit more closely. So in this paper, the respiratory causes were, was RDS, late respiratory failure, which is respiratory compromise over two weeks later for pulmonary hemorrhage. So that's what they used. And I showed you at Iowa with first intention jet, respiratory causes were only responsible for 8% of the deaths for infants born to 22 weeks versus this is from the peanut trial published in 2022. The, I was shocked when I saw this, 60% of the deaths at 24 weeks in these 19 NICUs in, in the United States was respiratory failure, which I find shocking since it really should be only 8%. And you can see even at you know, 25, 26 and 27 weeks, it still hovered around 50%, which again, to me is shocking having 25 and 26, 27 weekers, having the leading cause of death be respiratory failure, I think they, those people need a first intention high frequency approach. So acute morbidity, um, again, I use cumulative numbers and uh, severe IVH 22%, PPL5, <clears throat> VP shine 3%, neck 11%, which is going down as we, with the hemodynamic service. ROP needing interventions, just 11%. 
and 23 weeks, 16%, seven, two, eight, and six. And just to put this in perspective, uh, uh, only 11% needing treatment, 0% blindness. And the paper published a month ago out of Japan on their 22 weekers, 22% were blind. Um, now they had less smaller severe IVH rate than us, um, but their total IVH rate was very high at 61%. And our total IVH rate is 36% at 22 weeks. Um, this is just showing, this is a twin and his twin passed away from NEC. Here's another twin and his twin passed away from IVH. And of course the superior females and uh, they're actually probably sixth graders by now. Neurodevelopmental outcomes um, that was published in 2020 and severe NDI was only 11% for 22 and 23 weekers. Here's a 23 weeker here. This is her uh, high school graduation and she's in college now. Um, this again, small numbers, but at 22 weeks, severe NDI was 18%. Now we know from the work by Genevieve Taylor, when you follow up these kids from age two to age 10, two thirds of this improves. So to me, you know, with the right approach, severe NDI goes from 18%, you know, would obviously go down um, quite far to like 6%. Um, additional outcomes, um, you know, G tubes are possible or tube feeding that's 8% there. Um, mild CP includes up to 18%. Now, the VP shunt back here, uh, this 45 babies was 7% incidence. But when I updated it, we've, we've continued to get better on neuroprotective strategy. Our, our, our VP shunt was 2%. So we've only had four 22 and 23 weekers that ever needed to be uh, shunted. Um, there's a 23 weaker there. This is him at age 14. <clears throat> so in conclusion, survival at 22 to 20 weeks is extremely difficult. It's not impossible and, and not hopeless. And you know, you would think a gelatinous baby like this didn't even make it on the curve. And this is her here. And this is sort of an exception where the male had better lung development than the female, but her problem was she was SG8 to percentile. And then these are sort of twin to twin transfusion babies and that's them at age four. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Dr. Klein. Um, we'll maybe take a question or two from the chat. Uh, I had a couple of questions about the delivery room management. Uh, if you have any thoughts that you would like to hear about chest compressions in the delivery room and the reason for defaulting to a 2.0 at 22 weeks. So most of these babies, usually when we consult the parents, most of the time we will say that we're not going to do chest compressions that these babies usually respond incredibly well to having them intubated and ventilating them. And if someone's needing chest progressions, it's probably because they may be being born without a heart rate. Maybe this actually is a stillborn baby. So we don't encourage chest compressions. We kind of discourage that. Um, now, obviously, individual teams will decide what they want to do, but we, I, I heavily discourage that. What we encourage is getting an airway. And, the, and that's why the 2 tube is so important. Um, many times what happens with the 2-5 is that you'll see it go through the cords, but it will stop because the narrowest part is subglottic. And then people are struggling and then you can tear the trachea or basically, if you're lucky that you're not tearing the trachea, it keeps just bouncing off versus as soon as you switch and then you know multiple people have to try versus with the 2 tube, usually it goes in easy. Um, and you have no problem ventilating and oxygenating with the 2O tube with the jet at all, which we published on that. And it just avoids all the stress, you know, it, it minimizes all that stress. Um, and so, and the jet doesn't care if there's a leak. So, you know, that's the whole thing. If you, you don't really want to be dependent on a ventilator that you have to depend on tidal volume being returned through the tube, whether the CO2 exits through the tube around the tube to me doesn't matter. Now we do know with the 2O tubes, half those babies, it will get upsized usually around four weeks of life. But the, the key thing is, is getting through that the first, you know, 10 minutes is pretty critical. I mean, and so it just avoids all that stress. Now there are some places that refuse to have a 2.5 tube. Well, 
I don't understand why, um, but things go much better once. And again, this is what Japan does. This is what Sweden does. This is what we do. I think it's you know a pretty validated approach at, at 22 weeks. Thank you. And um, for infants not yet extubated by 30 plus weeks, are they still managed on high frequency? If not, do you ever transition to conventional? So what's what's nice is we're very comfortable with the the jet, and so if they're you know if they have significant enough lung disease that they just need they need to outgrow it, they need better nutrition, they need to be supported well um, while they're growing, we'll just leave them on the jet. So um, most of them will stay on the jet. So the question is now if their major problem is not lung disease but it's central apnea the jet is not even with side breaths is not very good with central apnea so those twin girls i showed they had clear lung fields but they just were breath holding and never breathing and so they they needed conventional ventilation for a long time until their brain matured um, and the majority of the time we would leave them on the jet with the idea that we'll extubate from the jet straight to uh, non-invasive NAVA. Yeah. And uh, we have some questions about the GI management. Uh, if you just can comment quickly on uh, the use of insulin for hyperglycemia, how, how. So, so yeah, so we don't use insulin. So we know you know, this is all, all this says, you know, what's interesting being old, a lot of this was figured out a long time ago. So the randomized controlled trials were done with insulin. And all that happened is you didn't improve brain growth, you didn't improve linear growth, you didn't improve muscle growth, you just increased adipose tissue deposition, you just made the babies fatter and fatter with no benefit. Um, so the key is, you know, when the babies are, th are this immature, and they're fully vent supported, their heat's fully supported, their brains are smooth, they don't consume much glucose. So this mystical number of four milligrams per kilo per minute is not really relevant to a 22 weeker. So some might be on three per kilo per minute, some might be on two. Um, really the only time we would might think about it if we were below or in the one range, but most of the time it's because someone started, the times you've used insulin for six, hours, 12 hours is because someone started on too much, uh, too high of a GIR. And so the key thing is to, you know, we, you know, basically there's no benefit of being hyperglycemic and it's, it's really just harmful. And the key is not getting there. And, and, you know, I mean, the, our endocrinologists speculate that their beta cells are also, the islets are pretty immature and you can basically, once they get hyperglycemic, they might, they just, they pour out their insulin and they're done. And you just can't let them get that way. So you have to really, you know, we've had deaths related to people just not calculating the GAR and getting and starting way over four. And then immediately the first, the first glucose on emission might be 60. And then the next one is 600. So insulin is not, is really not the way to go. And they'll let you know what will happen is over time. So the babies don't get catabolic as long as you're on at least two grams per kilo of protein uh, by 24 hours and at least 25 to 30 calories per kilo, the protein prevents them getting catabolic. And then they'll tell you as their brain grows, as they start breathing, oh, now I can handle 40 calories per kilo, then 45, then 50. It has to be very slow as their brain develops and they start to become more active. Thank you. And uh, we have a lot of people who are requesting the slides and the fellow card. So if you don't mind emailing those to me and we'll see if we can find a way to upload it to the uh, ONTPD. Cloud. Yeah, yeah, I'd be, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I can send you that, that stuff. Thank you. Thank you for- Glad to share. And uh, appreciate everyone's attendance. And if you don't mind leaving feedback and- uh, Here's what you have to look forward next in the upcoming few weeks. Again, thanks, Dr. Clay. Okay, thank you.